Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I am the program manager for Maven Project and I welcome you to today's session. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and our friends at Mariposa Community Health Center for hosting today's session, Management of Common Pediatric Acute Care Issues with Dr. Peter Kenny. Dr. Kenny is the founding pediatrician of Northampton Area Pediatrics in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, Dr. Kenny continues in part-time practice and also serves on the board of directors, um, which is a network of primary care pediatricians affiliated with Boston's Children's Hospital. Dr. Kenny's area of interest include general pediatrics, dermatology, and public health. He was a, awarded the Boston Children's Hospital 2017 Community Pediatrician Award in 2017 and the Hampshire District Med Society Community Clinician of the Year Award in 2019. And we're just very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Kenny, when you're ready, please bring up your slide deck and begin. Uh, thank you, Kristen. I think I'll have to update our <laughs> my the bio. <laughs> I, I just retired two weeks ago. Um, Congrats. And, uh, yeah, so it was a, a difficult uh, decision to make, but it, it was time and then having fun with uh, with Maven and glad to uh, meet with uh, people in Arizona this morning. Um, let's see, let me bring up some things here, here, okay. Great, so uh, today we'll be discussing some of the challenges of pediatric acute care, looking at specific cases. And, um, Again, by way of background, I've been a general pediatrician uh, for a long time, and uh, the uh, in many ways the, the field has has evolved and changed. Uh, some things remain constant. The main thing being that kids are fun. It's fun to practice pediatrics, to take care of children and their families, um, and it's a privilege to do it. So. Uh, what the cases that we're presenting and the challenges are not to interfere with that, but to um, just flesh out some of the realities that I'm sure you're already dealing with um, as you approach the care for children. Uh, let's see. But for some reason, I'm not advancing, Kristen. You know what? Uh, maybe. Let me just, I'm, I'm going to stop share for a second and see if I can um, bring up my own slide here. Okay. And, uh, I'm sorry to be so clunky about this. Okay. Let me try it again. Excuse my desktop. Okay. Okay, now it's working. Perfect. Sorry for that delay. So uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. That's what this slide is about. Uh, this is the accreditation that Kristen just went over about the MAVEN project um, uh, category one uh, credits. So the objectives are, to today are threefold. Um, and uh, the first one is to increase our awareness of signs of serious illnesses in children and young adults. Um, let's see, let's try to collapse that over, okay. Um, the, uh, the second is to increase our understanding of AI, artificial intelligence, as simply a useful tool, a powerful tool, but a, just a tool that does not diminish the need for the patient to be treated by the careful clinician. And the third is to increase our confidence to act on subtle signs of illnesses in children and young adults. So the, uh, the background to all of these objectives when you're in the exam room is to do these things, increase our confidence and understanding and our awareness is to be, I guess, protective of the fact we need time to do that in the exam room. There's no quick way to do the assessment of children 
if you keep in mind the possibility of serious illnesses that need your um, need your approach uh, to move forward. So what is the problem? Why can it be so hard to assess children? Um, well, to some extent, it's because young people are basically fit. They look pretty well, and we can think that this child can't be very sick. He, he looks okay. He's not that sick. Also, life-threatening illnesses in children, thank God, are infrequent. And for that reason, though, because they're infrequent, it's easier for us, all of us, me, you, everybody, to get somewhat complacent. Our instinct also is that children physiologically are like little adults, but they're not. And because they're not, the same illness can present differently in children than in older adults. So to illustrate that, the first case I want to uh, discuss with you is um, a simple sore throat in a young adult. And uh, the the per person we'll be discussing, the patient is a young adult because even that person is different than the older adult and different than the young child. And some of the features of this case, I think, will, will illustrate that. Um, also, let me pause here to say, given the, the larger numbers, please use the chat function. And uh, Kristen will, uh, as we're discussing this case, um, we'll uh, you know, give some sort of selected information about what you have to say and, and contributing. So it's a little bit hard with the numbers of people to do this with everybody using audio. So we'll use the chat function, but I definitely want to hear from people as we go along. So you're working triage in your ED on a very busy Sunday. It's a four hour wait to get to an exam room. An 18 year old Marine, Marine recruit um, is standing in front of your triage desk and says he has a sore throat. His throat culture in the ED two days ago was negative, so he's already been in the ED. But the pain now is so severe that he returned for a second visit. That's how, how this young guy presents to you. And just to give you an image, um, he's one of these young guys who, despite having a sore throat over the last few day, days, has uh, been in uh, training and, and is uh, strong, vigorous, gung-ho, all of that. This is the, uh, the basic setup for you. We're in triage, four hour wait, young Marine, negative throat culture. Anything else you wanna know? Does anybody have any? Any details about this guy that what I've mentioned so far are, are, are not sufficient? We'll, we'll pause for a few beats if people can. And Kristen, if you could just tell us what. Yep. So we have monospot, sexual history. Great. Great examples. So uh, great. Active HIV. Sorry. Acute great, HIV, great. not active. <laughs> okay, great. So, so at this stage of the presentation, um, let's try to not. These are all great things, really terrific. But let's let's defer a little bit the specific tests or even the exam to some extent. Is anything else about him? Remember, you're just you're assessing him broadly. Uh, his presentation as a person before you you've done any doctoring by you know checking his exam. Other question comment was just any other symptoms he may be experiencing like fever chills. Great, great. That's the yeah. All these things are great. So how about trouble breathing? Uh, well, it turns out he's breathing fine. You, you can see that uh, you're sitting at your triage desk. Does he have difficulty swallowing? He says his throat hurts and he, he does have difficulty swallowing. How about the sound of his speech? Is it normal or is it muffled? And again, that's a, a key thing to keep in mind as you're doing your initial assessment. Does it hurt to open his mouth? Or, or is, is that not a, a difficulty for him? And has he been drooling, uh, fatigue? These are just some of the additional things, as well as the things that people you have, you have already mentioned that kind of flesh out. We're beginning to think about what might be going on with this young guy. 
Um, and as this evolves, we'll see how some of these play into the, the assessment. Uh, again, you want by way of background. Again, we want to go back a little bit to this. Who is it you're dealing with? Young guy doesn't want to be here. Strong, vigorous, probably never really sick a day in his life. Doesn't want to look like a wimp, but he's standing in front of you. So these symptoms are are, uh, are there. Okay, let me ask. Uh, when do you examine him? It's a four hour wait to be seen in an exam room. Does anybody think he should be examined four hours from now or now or just, just to maybe think about that? And where do you examine him? Do you take a look at this young guy in the triage area or elsewhere? And then how, if you decide to examine him, do you do, you do your exam? So any people have any thoughts about that area, Kristen, did anybody? So far we just have or, urgent. Ur urgent? Yeah. Okay, great. Great question. Is it urgent is in the back of your mind. What is going on? And also, the first rule of medicine, do no harm. Can I make it worse? So Then we have oh. must consider contagion. And is he contagious? Exactly. Great, great. Great question. So do you examine his throat while you're in the triage area, in an exam room or in the OR? Seems like a silly question. He's in the triage area. Externally, he looks pretty good. He's got a little muffled uh, voice. And uh, what do you do at this point with this young guy? And when you examine him, do you use a tongue depressor? Um, it folds into the, uh, how worried are you at this stage about this young guy? So I can't see, let me, I don't want to do my chat myself. Anything else coming in, Christopher? Yeah, are? there is, but it's big words and we all know I messed those up. So concern, epiglottis. Epiglottis, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Retro thing, abscess, more urgent and examine room. Right, so these are all great questions. And, and then, so we'll proceed to, to the exam. See. Oh, there's to... one more, I'm so sorry. I would decide how soon to examine him based on vital signs and comparative urgency of other patients waiting and would examine him in a private setting. Right. So all of these are great questions and they, they are great points. and. Basically, it comes down to what diagnoses are you considering uh, kind of already before you even touch the patient. Uh, and um, the, the possibility, you're right, uh, whoever said epiglottitis, always something to consider. It was never a common situation even 50 years ago, but it did happen. And now it's le even less common, but it does happen. And uh, peritonsillar abscess, mononucleosis, strep throat, those are your top things that you're thinking about. You have no idea if this is what's going on or not, but you wanna be prepared for at least um, uh, addressing these issues if they are present. You know, also uh, this could be leukemia, this could be a, a, a foreign body, so other factors could be going on here and, and um, as well as uh, uh, gonorrhea and, and other things that people have mentioned. Um, so you do take a look at his throat, uh, in the triage area, very carefully, no tongue depressor. You don't want to stick anything back near his posterior, um, pharynx, his, his mouth, because you can gag him and, and acutely shut down his airway and where he would need immediate tracheostomy. As you can see, this young guy has a large peritonsillar abscess on the left side that's pushing his uvula all the way to the right. Uh, was it right to look at him in the triage area? In retrospect, maybe not a great idea. Maybe it should have been in the exam room. Uh, we were a little bit more prepared if he crashes. Um, and, um, you know, since his airway 
he was breathing normally, I, I wouldn't say he would necessarily be examined in the OR. Uh, to do an incision and drainage, which is what he needs urgently, uh, not emergency, but urgently, uh, to do that uh, is often done in the OR. Um, it has been done in the ER also. It's, it's, uh, it'll be dramatically better with that. So he turns out to have a peritonsillar abscess. This, you know, not that sick looking young guy that walks in and um, your index of suspicion is higher because of some of these other factors in his background of, of his age and being basically uh, healthy and not wanting to be there. Something else is going on. The IND, the incision and drainage is the main treatment as well as antibiotics to cover uh, strep, staph, anaerobes, and Typically, uh, clindamycin is uh, you know, sin is used for this. So I'm going to stop here for a second. And does anybody have any other questions about that? If you have um, any questions, you can type them in or if you just want to use the raise hand feature. As you know, I mess up on big words. <laughs> anybody have any? Have, have there, any of you seen a peritonsillar abscess in the last year? I'm sure some have. All right, well, let's move on to another, let's see, another case. That's the peritonsillar abscess. Let's see if this works here. Okay, so um, let's, let's discuss fever, fever in children. And why worry? Why why is it such a deal? Or maybe it isn't. Um, the majority of fevers in children, in fact, are not dangerous. Um, kids usually get better regardless of what you do. It could be also could be you know an AI robot driven or that that is caring following some algorithm, and the algorithms are very good at identifying dangerous febrile illnesses. So why, what is the role for the clinician um, in assessing fever in a child these days? Well, <clears throat> childhood fever actually is sometimes due to a very dangerous illness. Again, less common these days, but still occurs. The soft signs of dangerous illnesses um, are very hard to put into algorithms. And I would basically contend that it's impossible to put them in where your instinct, the subtle things you observe about a child and, and the family and the setting and everything else that contribute to your assessment are not going to be something that um, algorithms are going to um, make the diagnosis for you. And so it makes it often hard to recognize which child's fever is due to a dangerous illness. This child says the other 99 children you just saw, it's just a transient illness that is not um, matter whether you saw the child or not. So let me just pause about probing a little bit. Has our thinking about fever changed over say, the last years or decades? And I think in two ways that it has changed our, our approach to fever um, from from the days, uh, you know, certainly in the pre pre antibiotic era, a uh, hundred years ago, but even more recently, has it changed since two thousand nineteen pre COVID? Has it changed uh, since fifty years ago when my career began? Well, I think the success of childhood vaccines, which is phenomenal but especially the vaccines for H. flu and pneumococcal infections may have diminished the concerns we hold about febrile illnesses in children because we don't see these infections as often anymore. May have contributed to some sense of complacency. and We want to keep that in mind as a possibility. In the other direction, I, I do think that um, our personal concerns for COVID uh, especially early in the COVID uh, pandemic, may have altered how we examine febrile children, all of us, uh, despite wearing PPE at the beginning, uh, when we really did not want to get COVID, bring it home to our families and loved ones. 
Um, you know, I, I think we were naturally a lot quicker to examine a child's throat or look at a child's ear and, and rather than lingering, spending a long time face to face, intimately close. So um, although things are much better with COVID, um, uh, I, I think we carry some of our habits uh, based on our personal experiences and factors like the success of childhood vaccines. I think as much as possible, we want to make that not those factors not uh, interfere with our assessment when we say is, is the child very sick or not. So Ashley, a very sweet three-year-old child is brought in by her parents for a fever to 102.5, which started this morning. Now, Ashley is, is a child you know well. Uh, she was seen just last week for a routine physical. Today, all she has is a runny nose. She has no other symptoms except she isn't as peppy as usual. Something, oh, just doesn't seem right to her parents. So let, let me pause here. Just people would enter into the chat. Is there anything about this presentation that worries you a bit more than other factors? We'll, we'll wait a little bit, Kristen, for, to see if people have a... Thoughts about that? Not as much energy. Very good. Yep. Yeah. She is not as peppy as usual. She just uh, is usually a bright eyed kid. We'll play with you, hop up on the exam table, laugh. She's quieter than usual. How about who brought her in this morning? I mean, this seems silly, maybe, but I, I don't think so. Was she brought in by a neighbor? Was she brought in by yeah. anybody? I see somebody else entered something. Um, both parents. Both parents. Bingo. <laughs> it's, again, it seems silly, but in fact, you think about the last... I don't know, 30 kids you saw with fevers <clears throat> who were brought in by, by one or both parents. Most of the time, it's a parent. When two parents show up, something's a little different. And these are parents who are showing up because they are worried. And their worry where somebody doesn't seem quite right is part of the presentation, part of the history. <clears throat> is there anything else you want to know about Ashley? You know, factors like if she's not in daycare, if there's no dysuria. On your How list. long has fever been present? The fever just started this morning. A great question also. Thanks for bringing that up. How long has it been going on? If this child had had a tip of 102.5 since yesterday morning for 24 hours, <clears throat> that is a, a, important. The fact that it's just abruptly starting this morning is not bad, but it, it makes you, you'd be a little bit com more confident this is a benign illness that's been going on for 24 hours and not getting worse. Some <clears throat> other thoughts are sick contacts and vaccines. Yep, so no recent vaccines and, and no contacts of anybody. She's not in daycare. Uh, she had no vomiting, <clears throat> excuse me, or diarrhea, uh, headache. Is is not she, confused. Go ahead. Here's sorry. That. Is she eating or playing? And then other symptoms, URI symptoms? Just the URI, just the slight runny nose. Um, she's uh, had, did, did I, I don't know if she had breakfast this morning. Okay. Um, how about rashes? Rashes are an important thing that uh, you probably always want to ask about and keep in mind, not only in your history, but your exam about how carefully you look for rashes. So, Kristen, jump in if there's anything else that would contribute, because the big question, the big question always with fever is, could this be sepsis of one sort or another? <clears throat> and um, that's the question here for this child. 
The next decision you make is what parts of the exam do you do? How sick does this child look? And when do you proceed to do this or that? Particularly if you're thinking through the differential in the back of your mind about um, the child being safe, the family, you being safe, your staff being safe, all these things factor in. So the most important thing on the exam is the general appearance. How does this kid look? How does Ashley look? And she looks like herself. Usually she's very sweet. She does. If you ask her to touch the stethoscope, she does. She'll play with you a little bit, but she's not the way she was a week ago for her checkup. Um, getting the vital signs in cases of fever is very, very helpful. And um, not only the temperature itself, but uh, as she tachycardic, um, her blood pressure, if it's easy to do, certainly row two sat. And uh, blending with how is her color? Is she flushed or pale? Capillary filling is a very important feature in children. And you know, slow capillary filling, indicating a, a lower pressure or, or something else going on, sepsis being a possibility. A big decision you're going to make is do you examine her entire body for rashes? Excuse me. By history, she did not have a rash when she uh, came in. You were asking her parents, but she doesn't look right. Her neck, the range of motion of her neck, is she stiff at all? And then do you go ahead at this stage? You'll do it eventually, but at the stage to do the ears, nose, and throat, the lungs, the heart, and the abdomen. Um, there's no one right answer for these things, by the way, but it's, it's prompting that you, you will make a conscious decision about these things uh, as you proceed. Because there are diagnoses you never want to miss uh, that need your attention quickly or less quickly. This is an actual child that I saw in my office um, shortly after I opened the practice. So what diagnoses do we never want to miss? I don't know if anybody's typing anything, uh, Kristen, but this, when you undress this child, I did not examine her chest, her, her ears, nose, and throat. I, I'm trying to look at her whole body and her legs show this rash. <clears throat> so the differential diagnosis for this child sitting in front of you, what could this be? Let's uh, leave enough time for cases, but any other thoughts that people have now that you see the rash that she has? 102.5 fever started this morning, a little lethargic. No takers? Okay. <laughs> HSP. HSP, great, great thought. HSP. Um, so HSP is a great thought. This rash would be consistent with HSP. You can see the, uh, this, uh, it would be a vasculitis with uh, leading into the tissue, um, a little bit of swelling around the ankles. Um, the pre Go ahead. Meningitis? Meningitis, yeah, particularly, it could be any meningitis, but particularly meningococcemia, meningococcal meningitis. So those are your leading possibilities. There are others that can cause a vasculitis and, and presentation, but the abrupt onset of the fever, the being slightly lethargic um, and not herself. And this rash is a, a four plus emergency. Um, in those days, those were actually the pre septriaxone days. Um, we were two minutes away from the hospital uh, got her up to the hospital in, in two minutes. Uh, she had cultures um, and uh, had antibiotics given prior to doing an LP even. And this, this child died an hour later after arriving in the ER. Um, one of the uh, saddest cases I've had, uh, but one I certainly would never forget. Meningococcemia is a horrible disease. Um, fever, somnolence, headache, rash. And basically it prompts us always to keep in mind the question to ask, is this child's fever possibly due to sepsis of some sort or at uh, almost the worst would be meningococcemia. Dr. Kenny, we have a question. Could you please define HSP? Oh, Henoch-Charnline purpura. 
<clears throat> HSP is um, usually without a child who may have a, a mild cold, no fever, <clears throat> a, um, um, a rash uh, similar to this. Uh, this would be on the, on the severe side, typically on the legs. It can be elsewhere, so the, the distribution on the legs is very typical for HSP. And uh, these micro bleeds into the skin also can occur into the um, uh, into the gut. So the, the abdominal pain can occur. Uh, some hematuria can occur with eruptional Um uh, So the it, this is something that needs got further evaluation and treatment in the differential diagnosis as tests are done, but it's not something that uh, immediate treatment is going to be needed, like antibiotics are needed immediately for somebody who has meningococcemia. So let's just go uh, joint pain. So this, it hurts when he stands. What's going on with this, uh, this patient? Well, I, I contend that something is going on with him because joint pain, in my opinion, in a child is always significant. Um, if you exclude acute pain due to trauma, uh, somebody bumped his knee and his knee hurts, joint pain is not that common a childhood complaint. So when somebody comes in and I have, you know, my hip hurts, it's, you listen up. Should anyway, but especially in that situation. Because other complaints that somebody might have that are vague, like abdominal pain or a vague headache, uh, happens often enough in daily practice and often have an uncertain cause. So we don't know specifically why the tummy ache is there, but in contrast, joint pain in a child usually has a specific presentation and a specific cause if you look for it. So in this case, this is a few days ago, your patient told his dad that his hip was uncomfortable while he was running. Yesterday, he had a very slight limp, even while walking. And this morning, ever since he woke up, he can't bear weight on that leg. Otherwise, he says he's absolutely fine. So anything else you want to know about this patient? Let's take a few seconds to just type in. Age and weight. Hey, okay, very, very, very good. <laughs> I neglected to tell you, he's 13 years old. And did you ask about his weight or his height? Weight, weight. Hey. Yeah, his weight is, uh, his BMI is at the 95th percentile. He's not the kid in the picture I showed you. This, the child who presented his 95th percentile of weight. URI symptoms? Great question. Uh, he does not have a preceding URI or a current URI. Injury? Injury, great question. Also, not that he knows of. He was, uh, he's not a runner, but he was running uh, after one of his friends when his, uh, he noted that his, uh, his hip was uh, hurting him a little bit. So the, the age, the person who asked that's great. You have to know the age. A 13-year-old is real different than a six-year-old. So talking about the differences by age, physiologically, the, the types of typical diseases. Is he on any meds? You'll want to know this about him. Um, it turns out he doesn't have any GI disorders, but you are thinking about problems like Crohn's disease can present with joint pain, not uncommonly. Hormonal disorders. Well, it turns out he does have hypothyroidism. And this young guy is on Synthroid and has been for a number of years. Uh, again, no trauma history. Uh, severity, it, again, it has changed over the last uh, uh, days uh, with uh, going from very mild, then slight limp, and now severe. Key question to ask is, does it interfere with sleep? Although he has extreme pain when he's bearing weight, uh, he slept well last night. Somebody who, uh, a young person having joint pain or pain um, in an extremity that wakes him up from sleep, in the back of your mind, you always think about, could this be a tumor of some sort? Rare, but still, you want to think about that, as well as tick bites, rashes, he traveled recently, 
and always keep in mind again the systemic symptoms fatigue chills fevers there's just something on a systemic basis going on so let me ask you all um when you do your exam do you go right for the money kid comes in he's got right hip pain and nothing else is going on he tells you doc i'm fine my hip just hurts so do you have him lie down and examine his hip is that uh, just a yes or no, I guess I <laughs> can't ask for a show of hands on this, but I, my, my guess is probably most of you, hopefully everybody would say, no, you don't go right for the money. Don't go right for his hip and start examining him. Yes, it's worth checking his vital signs. Uh, is he febrile? Does he have a slight tachycardia or you know, bradycardia or something else going on? Certainly his weight has always been asked. His BMI is very important. On your way down to the hip, do you examine his skin, his throat, his neck? Why not? These things can be relate to a differential diagnosis. And on the way, do you also pause to check him for murmurs or his abdomen? Maybe he's got a big liver. You wouldn't know it if you go right to the, to the hip. In particular, on the way down, do you palpate his back or his other hip? Do you examine him uh, for other possible causes of hip pain? that might be there as the cause or in addition to the cause that he has uh, at the hip itself. So if we think about some of the causes of joint pain in children, <clears throat> the list is, is large, very large. The infectious causes, um, septic joints, uh, Lyme disease, discitis, rheumatic fever, um, you know, all those things are possible um, and, and not uncommon, uh, or maybe not common, but at least often enough, you will see those in your career. Um, inflammatory causes, arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, toxic synovitis, Crohn's, as I already mentioned, and the ne rare neoplastic causes like acute lymphocytic leukemia or osteoid osteoma, a tumor, bone of the, a tumor of the bone. Uh, can presenting with pain like this. But because of this presentation with this kid, his age, his weight, and this and that, you're thinking is orthopedic, could it be leg perthes disease, typically a disease of six-year-old, seven-year-old, or could it be a slip capital femoral epiphysis? Skippy slip capital femoral epiphysis is something that would be on your differential because your differential, what you're thinking, will influence how you approach the next steps of evaluation. When you do examine him, his exam is normal other than uh, internally rotating his hip. It causes extreme pain. Otherwise, you cannot detect anything else on palpation or range of motion. So you proceed to study. So the big decision that you'd be making at this point is you've got a young guy sitting in front of you. He's afebrile. Pain hurts when you internally rotate him. <clears throat> what do you do? And there's a lot of possible things that you can do. Let's pause for a second, Kristen, just to ask if people have any thoughts about what to do next in terms of studies. Does anybody want to do an orthocentesis? Imaging. Imaging. Okay. Which imaging would you do? X-ray. X-ray. Great. Love it. All right. Yeah. Some other thoughts were overweight, pain with internal rotation, uh, X-ray hip, and then to start with X-ray. Right. Right. I think that's great. A great approach. There's a lot of things you could possibly do, but in this particular case, they are probably, you can still do them if necessary, but not as uh, as so likely as a slip capital thermal emphasis. Because you're asking yourself, is this possible? And the, the history points you in this direction. It usually occurs in early adolescence during the rapid growth spurt beginning, often in boys, often boys that are obese, but not always. Uh, also, hormonal disorders uh, are additional risk factors for a slip capital thermal emphasis, and uh, he does actually he's hypothyroid. 
So what is it, uh, and it's giving you this book, Capital Federal Deficit, and why do we worry? It's not emergent, like some of the, of the other cases we've talked about, but it is important because it is a displacement of the femoral head above the growth, growth, growth plate. The way the uh, femur sits in the acetabulum um, is not stable, where the, the slippage of the, the uh, femoral head above the growth, growth plate and different degrees of slippage will have different consequences for, for the, the, the patient. 15% of people who have a uh, slip capital femoral epiphysis do not have hip pain, but have uh, thigh or knee pain as they're uh, only presenting um, complaint. So if somebody comes in with knee or particularly thigh pain, definitely want to check the hip carefully. The pain quality is not that helpful. It can be chronic, uh, acute or subacute like this patient or very intermittent. What's well, possible. And you want to do this because there's an essential treatment you will have this person do, which is to stop bearing weight. If you allow this kid to bear weight between now and when an orthopedist sees the child and, and uh, they can arrange for surgery to uh, prevent worsening of the slippage by pinning this um, hip, the uh, uh, it can get much, much worse and, and the, the child can have uh, much more severe consequences. If you catch it early and the uh, surgical treatment is, is done, then uh, the outcome should be very good and, and not having long-term problems. So, worth considering. So I think we probably have time for head injuries. Um, Unless, are there any other comments? I don't want to, I'm not seeing them, Kristen, but should you bring? No, I don't see any comments, but if you do have any questions, please put them in and I'll interrupt Dr. Kenny. <laughs> so, the, so the head injuries, uh, so when are they, when are mild head injuries a problem? And why do we worry about assessing kids' head injuries in particular? Because really most head injuries, a bump on the head are mild and benign and no big deal, right? Uh, and the hard information, what I call hard information, the pupils, they're either blown or they're not, or reactive or not, you know, the reflexes, the, the PCARN score, they can reliably identify dangerous injuries in most children after head injury. So why, I mean, you can just plug in information and um, no need to come see the clinician, right? What, what value do we add? Well, I, I think we add potentially uh, a lot of value with the soft information. Again, the subtle signs of the appearance of the person, the interaction, it's of great value, particularly in children in assessing head injuries. So Stanley, the 19-month-old, comes to your office at 11.45 in the morning after falling and hitting his head on the coffee table. There is no loss of consciousness, no vomiting. He is not lethargic. And his mom is an experienced mom, uh, but he's a little worried because Stanley is a bit quieter than usual. So that's the setting. Um, it turns out Stanley lives around the corner from your office, um, and you are alone in the office, and uh, it's getting close to lunchtime. I'll put those then. But anything else you want to know about Stanley or his presentation, and let's just take a minute to have people contribute if they have thoughts about this situation. Any comments uh, or thoughts, Kristen? Not yet. Okay. So when this happens, uh, let me go back a little bit to show you the visual. About um, bruising, bruising, swelling, hematomas, and if so, where? Exactly. So great, great question. So no, his mom did not, again, we're at the history stage here, did not notice any bruising. Um, uh, she did say he had a little swelling where he hit his head. And uh, so some of the other, repeat that again, Kristen, the bruising. Bruising, swelling, and hematomas. And then we also have uh, seizures. 
So, right. So he, he didn't, he was not observed to have a seizure, but it's a great question. Yeah. Oh, how much or how long did he cry and what caused his fall? Uh, he just cried for a few minutes, but what caused his fall is a great question. So <clears throat> was he chasing his brother? Did he trip and fall? You know, was he jumping on the couch, which would influence the distance? that he fell, all of these things are great questions. So thanks for bringing those up. Because these types of things, are the details you want to know, are, will play into your assessment in this situation, this time of the day and everything else. So how about the exact time when the injury occurred? He comes into your office at 11.45. Did this injury occur the day before again, or is uh, immediately before. It turns out mom lives around the corner uh, and it occurred 15 minutes before, so 11.30 in the morning. And uh, he's in your office at 11.45. The location of the injury was also important. As it turns out, Stanley's injury was right here at this exact location. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, How does Stanley usually behave? Again, he's a kid you know. You saw him for his 18-month checkup, and he's now 19 months. He's a quiet kid anyway, but how is he quiet? Or is it physically or socially? It turns out it's both. He, 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 he's, a, he's not a, a child who will cry when you come close to him, but, but he will, you know, he'll look at you and, and uh, um, speak briefly a little bit. Uh, physically, he is the kind of kid who, on request, will go over and get a toy, but right now he doesn't seem interested in doing that. So th those are, are things, some of the things, only some of them that, that you want to know about him. And on his physical exam, does he look, again, his appearance, does he look well or is he ill, even slightly ill? And he looks slightly ill. Um, he's a pale type kid anyway, but it was, he was a little bit more so. Um, on his, uh, does he have bradycardia on his pulse? Again, a sign of increased intracranial pressure of some sort if your heart rate is slow. When you inspect, the, there's no bruising of the scalp. When you inspect or palpate the scalp, um, it, although there's no bruising or laceration, there is slight swelling in this area of this temple. You definitely are going to check his pupils. Um, very uh, important, and they were equal and reactive. So, a question for you all is: Do you, with this 19-month-old, examine his optic discs? Um, uh, and I would even say: Do you go through the motions of examining his optic discs, even if you don't see them well? If it's truth be told, because it's tough to do in a young kid. This is a boy I saw, um, and uh, he. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember if I examined his optic discs and everything turned out fine for him. We'll just get to the chase about that. But you definitely want to uh, also look at him an age appropriate neuro exam, again, looking for subtle signs uh, and checking his gait and asking him to reach for a toy that you hand him and other ways of assessing him that are not on the uh, artificial intelligence um, pathway or paradigm. That, that make you worried about him or not. So how worried, let me pause here, just ask how worried are you about him? It's almost lunchtime, your staff is going home, um, you live up the road yourself, your, your house is up there and, and patient lives around the corner. Um, other factors I would throw into the equation is your ER is two minutes up the road, there was no neurosurgeon in your ER uh, or in your uh, entire region of Western, our region of Western Massachusetts, except one, and you're not sure which hospital he's at in, in Western Massachusetts at this time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with this situation, um, I uh, instructed his mother to call immediately since the pre-cell phone days, call the office immediately. We had somebody still banning the phones. Uh, if he changes, if he vomits, if he's more lethargic, anything is off with him. Um, and uh, I, I touched base with her when I got back from lunch in about an hour. 
uh, went home and um, immediately getting in the door, uh, got a call from my office that his mom had called that he had vomited and he um, is, is lethargic now. Had him immediately come to the office uh, and, and saw him at that time. And um, see, you know, the next steps here are still going to design. Um, this is what I saw. This is not him, but this is what he looked like at that time with a blown pupil. Um, breathing, not interacting, lethargic, pale. And um, I, you know, we thought we might lose him right there in the office. Um, the uh, called up to the ER, said we're coming. Um, put a call in for an ambulance. A uh, before the ambulance could show up, a very far great policeman in town heard the call going out and thought, "New pediatrician in town calling for an ambulance. This can't be good." So he came by and um, uh, I said, please take us to the ER right now. I climbed in the back seat carrying the child. We went up to the ER. Uh, he was given IV mannitol, which um, acutely helped with the brain swelling that was going on. And so this pupil became normal. Um, we did not intubate him. Found out that the neurosurgeon was in the hospital 20 minutes away. Uh, went to that hospital um, in, in the ambulance being prepared to, to uh, intubate him if necessary. Uh, neurosurgeon met us at the door of the ER, uh, swept us right into uh, an OR, which was part of the ER there. And this is what he had, was the one thing we would never ever want to miss, <clears throat> an epidural bleed, which... Uh, as soon as the uh, epidural, uh, as soon as the skull was opened and the pressure was relieved, his color immediately improved, his, uh, everything improved, his pupils were normal and reactive. And uh, that was the uh, uh, situation. He survived, he did well, thank God. But it was uh, not, uh, not evident. Um, um, Likelihood is that you may not have seen this. This is not something somebody would necessarily see in a career, but you may. And the things to keep in mind is the location of the injury, particularly this kind of an injury where the middle meningeal artery is injured in that gray area that's shown, where it's um, an area where the plates of the skull, uh, the parietal temporal sphenoid, um, sutures come together and the um, the artery traces a little bit more superficial so it's not protected by, by bone as well. And injury in that location is more prone to having um, a bleed occur, an acute epi epidural bleed, not a subdural, which prevents more slowly. Um, so that uh, was the situation with this young kid. Trauma to the middle meningeal artery is a common cause of an epidural hematoma. Um, it's always important to be aware of the aware, where we, of the lucid interval, the couple of hours to three hours of time between the injury when a person feels not so bad and um, as a normal exam, but that is expanding and uh, Basically, to always, especially during that period of time, suspect could this be an epidural bleed? And always, always, always know where you can get a, and how quickly you can get a CT in a neurosurgeon um, when you need one because that is uh, life saving. So that's uh, the overview there. Um, let's see, what time do we have? We have a couple minutes. We have about four minutes. People have any, have you, uh, any of you seen an epidural bleed yourselves in, in any age person? Maybe you can unmute people if they want to raise yeah. your hand. If you raise your hand, I will unmute you so you can speak to uh, Dr. Kenny. Um, I'll read what you write in the Q&A or the chat box. 
Tá bom, tá bom, tá bom. Tá bom. Go Takers. Where is your neurosurgeon there in oh. Arizona? How far away is your, do you have somebody in town or? Oh, the group in Arizona, uh, Dr. Williams. So it's about an hour, hour and 20 minutes away. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, great. Now I can see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, and... You know, we have a team of nurses here as well. They um, are asking about the PCARN score. If you can just go into a little bit more information about that. Yeah. yeah. So I need to look that up again myself. It's, a, it's something developed after my, uh, sort of my career. But basically, you um, there's a score that's uh, uh, easily available online. Um, you, I think the distance of the fall, uh, location, the age of the child is very important. And several other factors give you a score about the likelihood, and, and you follow an algorithm that basically says, you know, uh, observe, uh, image now. Um, so it, it's quite useful. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to, to give you more of an explanation. I'm going to, to check that again. Um, I haven't personally used it. I, I became aware of it. Again, one of the problems with an older clinician is we go with what we know from years ago. Uh, I became aware of it probably about four years ago. It hadn't had a, a young child with a head injury since then. And by saying that AI and the algorithms are, um, I'm not trying to say they're, they're bad. I think they're great, but they are incomplete. Then the, the, your sense of how this kid is, and if you're nurses, I can't tell you how many times I've been seeing my nurses <laughs> um, who have uh, who have said, "Listen, doc, you better take a closer look. Or I want you to. I'm worried about, about uh, this child." Are there any other questions about anything? It was a great talk, Dr. Kinney. It's very, very informative. Thank you. Okay, I hope it helps. All right, so I'm just going to remind everyone on the call, the group that's on screen, but everybody else as well, that the CME session, I'm sorry, the CME survey is going to deploy after this, uh, after we close out of this webinar. You need to get correct the date, March 19th, and the speaker's name, Dr. Peter Kenny. And I also put the link in the in the chat. And to use your email address that's um, with the Maven Project, the email address that is involved with your Maven Project account. Um, if you have any challenges, please email me. Uh, and other than that, thank you, Dr. Kenny, so much for being here. And thank you all for joining us today. My pleasure. Bye-bye.